Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. If you're a guest here today, uh, we appreciate you being here with us as well. If you're online, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy weekend uh, to be here with us today. There are a few scriptures I'm going to read here at the beginning. First one is found in John chapter 16, verse 33. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me, that in me ye might have peace, and the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I'm up here today to tell you that it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. If you had a great day with family or it wasn't such a great experience, that God says that he is still here for you today. That there is a peace that is here for you today. So we can find hope and we can find encouragement in that because we know that God is here for us today. Like I had said, thank you for taking time to be at church today. Uh, I know that there are some that are traveling so that they couldn't be here, but for those of you who are here, thank you for your time. But I want you to know that God is here for each and every one of us today. If we need peace, God says that He will give us peace. If we need comforted, God said that He's going to comfort us. So if we we'll all stand in this place, all thinking and having the same thought that God is here today, that He's willing to move, that He's going to touch and move in each and every one of our lives today. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. God, I thank you for uh, for this service today. I thank you for these people that are here today, God. Lord, I pray that your presence will flow down upon each and every one of us, God. Lord, I pray, God, that we leave this place transformed, God. Lord, I pray that your peace, God, that passeth all understanding will be here with us today, God. Lord, I pray that no matter what we came into this place with today, that you are here and that you love us and that you care for us, God. Lord, and I pray that you will anoint this service. God, I pray, Lord, that you will move upon every person that is in this room today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Worship with the singers as they sing today.
Come on, give him praise. Come on, he's worthy of my praise. Lord, I exalt you. Come on, he's already won the victory. Come on, you need the praise like it's already won. Hallelujah, Jesus, we exalt you. We magnify you. We stand in confidence today. We stand in victory today. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. It feels good in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you for being here today in service. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. I know it's a busy time for many people, but thank you for being here today, for being in the house of the Lord. And it uh, feels good to look out and see some familiar faces. I don't usually know anyone out there, but I'm glad that I know some people out there. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I want to thank, I know they're not here today, but thank the Jeans for allowing us this opportunity and privilege to be here and to speak to you today and to this church. And I uh, want to thank everyone for your support as well. I know there's people in this place that are supporting us in this church. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we are making headway. We're about two-thirds done. And so we're praying here after the new year to finish up here in a few months and be headed to Wales. And uh, we're believing God for great things. And we ask you just to keep praying for Wales. Tell you, we've been traveling and there have been so many people that have spoken words about what God wants to do in Wales. And we're just believing it and hold on to it. And we ask you that you just keep praying. Amen. I believe there's people that are hungry and searching. And I believe, I know you believe it too. God can work without us there. God can fill someone with the Holy Ghost today in their home right now. And I'm believing for God's Spirit to move and touch. So thank you for all of that, for your support. And it is good to be back home. It is good to see everyone. And um, we're going to get into the Word of the Lord this morning in Luke chapter 19. That's a used one, Brother Burner. It's a used water. I don't drink from those. I don't have the same faith. Luke chapter 19, and uh, beginning in verse 29, we're going to read three verses, 29 through 31. Thank you, Brother Jim. There we go. That caffeinated water, Dasani there. It says, and it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, this is Jesus, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, and the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. Now I know we've just had Christmas yesterday, and I pray you had a good Christmas. Uh, and this goes towards the end of Jesus' life, but we're going to circle back around at the end. But I want to preach to you this morning from this title, Loosed for a Purpose. I ask you to pray one more time as we go into the Word this morning. Lord Jesus, we come before you. Lord, we're so thankful for your Spirit that we feel in this place. Lord, we don't ever want to take for granted, Lord, your presence, your power, God. And Lord, I pray that you would have your way in our hearts and lives today, that you would speak to me today, God, that you would anoint my ears to hear your voice today, Lord. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. This is a part of the story that we read of Jesus last week on earth. And this incident that we read about, it precedes the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where Jesus rides in on the colt, on the very donkey mentioned in this story. We know that story goes that the crowds gather and coats are laid in the road and the people are waving palm branches and crying, Hosanna. Of course, we know that in just a few days, it would be the same crowd who would be yelling for Jesus' crucifixion. But we find in this little story here that we read, we find a few little interesting points. The story itself is simple enough. Jesus tells two of his disciples, we're not sure who they were. Most people surmise it was Peter and John, but he sends two of his disciples to enter into the nearby village and to look for a certain colt or donkey. And upon finding it, they were to loose it and bring it back to Jesus. 
And if anyone asked what was going on, they were to tell them that Jesus had need of the donkey. Now the first part, the first aspect I gather in this story is just mind-blowing. It's just life-changing. And it'll, it'll cause you to wake up in the middle of the night thinking about this. But the first thing that had to happen in this story is we find that the donkey was tied up and the donkey had to be loosed before it could do anything else. You can't do anything while you're tied up. You can't do anything while you're attached to the stake in the ground or the fence post. This donkey had to be loosed before it could do anything else. I want to tell someone this morning that God is still in the loosing and delivering business today. God is still looking for hearts and lives that need deliverance, that need set free, that need salvation in their lives. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, Jesus is in the synagogue and he gets up and he begins to read from the prophet Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then scripture tells us Jesus closed the book. He gave it to the minister and he sat down and everyone just sat and stared at him. So you know that's trouble when everyone just sits and stares at the preacher. So you know what Jesus did? He got back up. <laughs> And he got back up and he said one more thing. He said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now I believe on that day, if anyone would have stood up in that synagogue and said, yes, I need delivered. Yes, I'm broken hearted. Yes, I need my sight that Jesus would have healed them that day. But I also believe that it was more than just this day. I believe that when Jesus said this day, he meant this day in the synagogue. But from this day forward is well, that the scripture is still being fulfilled. That means if you're broken hearted here today, Jesus can mend your heart. That means if you need deliverance today, Jesus can set you free. If you are bruised, if you have hurts and pains, Jesus is here today to set you free. Oh, I'm thankful for that day that I found Jesus and that he set me free in my life. I know that Jesus is still able to do this. I know Jesus is still in the same business because I stand here today and I look around and I know there's other people in this place who were just like that donkey, just like that colt that day that you were bound by things in your life, that sin had a hold of your life, that addictions had a hold of your life, but Jesus showed up and he set you free. Oh, come on, someone needs to give him praise for that moment in your life when Jesus stopped by your way and he set you free in your life. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he begins listing all of these sins and he lists 10 sins which we know are the, as the works of the flesh. And Paul, I'm kind of surprised that he only has 10 because I think I can come up with more than 10 sins but I think that he just got tired of writing all these sins down, so he quit at 10 because it seemed like a good number. But he, he lists those 10 sins, and then he writes the famous verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. He says, and such were some of you. And it's these next words, though. I know people get goosebumps when they hear certain things or when something begins to happen or certain music begins to play. But if you have ever experienced this, these words that I'm about to read should give you goosebumps. They should make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because Paul says, such were some of you, but ye are washed, but you are sanctified but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, I'm glad I'm not who I used to be, but he washed me, he cleansed me, he sanctified me, he justified me, and I can stand here today. I can lift my hands in freedom. I can clap my hands rejoicing for what Jesus did in my life. Very quickly, how does this freedom happen in your life? The first place that it must begin is through repentance. You've got to repent, and that simply means you need to come before God, and you need to ask for forgiveness for everything that you've done wrong in your life, whether you knew you were doing it or not. 
And then you must make a conscious decision that you're not going to live your life the same way that you were. You can't save yourself, but you can't walk out of this place and expect God to keep you from every temptation. You've got to make up your mind that you're not going to live the same way. It always starts with repentance. And then you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Scripture says you'll go down an old man, but come up a new man. And then you need to receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. This is how you are set free. This is the beginning of the journey. And let me tell you, you can be loose today. You can be set free today. You can find an altar of repentance. You can be baptized in Jesus' name. You can receive the Holy Ghost today. The second aspect of this little story I find interesting is how Jesus used his power and his authority. Jesus had all power and authority. He could have done this by himself. He could have, you know, he he was God manifest in the flesh, and so he could have just said, he could have just muttered under his breath, donkey, I want you to come here. And you know what would have happened? That donkey would have come walking up a few minutes later. He could have just thought, I want that donkey to come here. You know what would have happened? That donkey would have come walking up a few minutes later. I remember Noah and the ark. The animals just showed up when they were supposed to. This animal could have just met them there. He could have done it anyway. He had all power and authority. But Jesus chose to delegate that power and authority to his disciples. You see, I think we need reminded every so often of what God has given us of what God has placed inside of us. That after we are loosed, that after we experience a new birth experience, that we receive an authority and a power in our life. Jesus tells a parable in which the servants were given authority. In Mark chapter 13, he says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told his disciples in Matthew chapter 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Mark closes out his writings in Mark chapter 16, Jesus again speaking. And he says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That sounds like a pretty interesting church to be a part of. That sounds like some powerful things happening there. But I want you to understand, Jesus spoke these words to his disciples face to face. That means Jesus was still here. That means he had not gone to a cross. He had, he, well, when he speaks the words in Mark, he has been to the cross and he has been resurrected, but we're not at Acts yet. We haven't had Acts chapter 2 yet. There has been no outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So I want you to realize that when Jesus speaks these words to his disciples, they did not have what you and I have right now. We look at them and think, boy, I'd like to have that. And they were just moved on by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost would just overshadow them. But let me remind you today that there is something powerful. There is something dynamic that is dwelling inside of you today if you have the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I hope you realize, if you've got the Holy Ghost, there is a dynamic power residing inside of you. (laughs) In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, 
Paul is telling them, first of all, he says, he's talking about the Spirit, and he says it's the Spirit which will be quickened when Christ returns for his church. If you're wondering why you need the Holy Ghost, that's why, because the Holy Ghost is what's going to quicken you on that day. But he prefaces that, he makes a statement. He says, if the same Spirit which raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. Now, that's one of those phrases, because it said the start, we can just kind of gloss over that. But I hope you understand what Paul is saying. I know we're not supposed to have levels of miracles, but if there were levels of miracles, I would think raising someone from the dead would be pretty high up there. I would think, man, that's pretty powerful. If I heard a story about someone being raised from the dead, I'd start to think, man, I want the power they have. Man, I was, I, they, they must have something special. But Paul says, if the same spirit which raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. He says there is resurrection power inside every single person that has the Holy Ghost. That means it's inside of you. If you've got the Holy Ghost, there is resurrection power inside of you. I know we may have different gifts. I know we may have different personalities. I, may we, I know we may not operate in the same way within a church. But let me tell you, we've all got the same power inside of us. And it's resurrection power. Do you remember what the resurrection was? I hope you do. <laughs> That's pretty simple there. Jesus was dead and he was resurrected back to life. That's what the resurrection was. And so when, when Paul says there is resurrection power inside of you, that means there is power to speak to dead things and bring them back to life. So what does that mean for you and I? Because that doesn't just talk about sickness. But that means when you go to work tomorrow, if you have to go to work and someone begins to talk to you and they begin to tell you about their marriage that's fallen apart or their kids who are doing this or their finances that are a mess. I know you may not be a preacher. You may not be a Sunday school teacher. You may not even hold a position in this church. But if you've got the Holy Ghost inside of you, you can start to speak life into dead things. You can begin in that moment to allow the Spirit and the power of God to flow through you. Yes, it's inside of you. You can speak life into the addicted. You can speak hope into the hurting. You can speak restoration into the broken. You can speak peace into the fearful. You can speak joy into the depressed. You can speak love into the abused because you have the power of the Holy Ghost inside of you. And realize, too, when you get the Holy Ghost, God gives you the Holy Ghost. <laughs> He's not up there judging whether, how hard you're praying, saying, well, they're really praying a bunch, so I'm going to give them a lot. They're kind of praying, so I'm going to give them a little. Or they're going to be a preacher someday, or they're going to be this someday, so I'm going to give them a little more. No. There's only one Holy Ghost. And when you get the Holy Ghost, you get all the Holy Ghost. So quit looking around at someone else and start realizing, no, it's not in them. It's in me. I can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. I can bring resurrection into somebody's life. I can bring healing to somebody. I can bring deliverance to somebody. We need to quit thinking about ourselves and start realizing it's not us, but it's the power inside of us. It's the power of God inside of us. We're not calling on ourselves, but we're calling on Him. And He trusted us enough to put the authority and power in us. We might as well use it in our lives. And the last thing I want to look at is the phrase that Jesus gives His disciples to tell if someone asks them what they are doing. Now, I don't know about you. Sometimes I put myself in Bible stories, soup them up a little bit, change them a little. <laughs> 
And in my head, whenever I read this story, and I think about owning a donkey, first of all, I think, why, why do I own a donkey? <laughs> why in the world, what possessed me to buy a donkey at that auction? <laughs> it came free with the end of the wagon. <laughs> Paid a dollar for it all. But I began thinking about this, about having a donkey, and I just imagine in my head, I'm sitting in my living room, and there's a big window, and I've got coffee, because it's the morning time, because I'm, I'm making up the story. It's a nice light roast Jerusalem blend coffee, a new roaster in Jerusalem. And I'm sitting there, and these two guys walk up, and again... It's my story, so don't argue with it. But for some reason, the donkey's tied up at the end of the road. I don't know why he's not in the back in the barn, but he's at the end of the road. And I'm just sitting there looking at my donkey, thinking, my, that's a mighty fine donkey. Maybe I'll get my phone out and start videoing my donkey and put on social media. I think there's people in here that do that. Where are they? No, I'm kidding. Oh, there we go. Nice to see you making pierogies there, Brother Tim. I made them this year, too. Still made them. So maybe I've got pierogies by me, too, for breakfast. But I see these two guys walk up, and they start untying my donkey. And maybe in my head, maybe just at first, I'm like, to no one, because no one else is there, what are they doing with my donkey? And they keep untying it. So finally, I open the window or open the door and yell out there, hey, what are you doing with my donkey? I don't know what I'm doing with it, but I don't want you to have it because it's my donkey. So I'm sure if you were in the same circumstance, if you had a donkey and it was tied up and two, two guys just come walking from out of town and start untying your donkey, you might ask them, what are you doing with my donkey? And so Jesus thinks about that. And he gives them some words to say in case someone stops him and says, what are you doing with my donkey? And Jesus says, I want you to tell him, the Lord hath need of him. That's all you got to tell him. Now, I don't know about you, but the longer I live for the Lord, the more I realize I need him. I realize today I need him a whole lot more than I did 10 years ago. I need him more every day. I think most people are in agreement with that, that we need God more every day, not less. But I want to leave you with this thought this morning. Not only do I need God, but God needs me. God has need of you. Is God able to accomplish his will without you? Absolutely. God can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. While we're having church right now, God could begin filling people with the Holy Ghost in their homes all around this church building if he wanted to. He could do that. But God chose to partner with humankind. He set it up this way. He chose to partner with the church. In fact, God chose to partner with this church. Or if you're a visitor with your church, God chose to partner with the church. And because of that, God needs you. Paul writes to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul says, one day I was traveling on the road. And Jesus, a light shone down from heaven, and Jesus apprehended me. That literally means I was arrested. I was stopped in my tracks. That one moment I was just going about my way, and then God showed up and stopped me right in the middle of what I was doing. First of all, I'm thankful for that day that God stopped me going my own way and he stopped me in the middle of my tracks and he arrested my soul and he changed the course of my life. But then Paul says, I am trying to apprehend. I am trying to arrest. I am trying to grab a hold of the reason that Jesus stopped me. 
in the context of this message. What Paul is saying is he's saying, I am saved for a reason. I have been loosed for a purpose. Jesus has need of me. Now make no mistake, I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you're sitting in one of those white chairs. I'm glad you're not somewhere else, but you are here. But God did not save you just to sit in a white chair. Again, make no mistake, your salvation is very important. You must be saved, but God doesn't want to just save you. He saved you for a reason, and he saved you for a purpose. God needs you in the kingdom. God needs you in this church. You have been loosed for a purpose. No, I don't know about you, but most of the time is I don't really feel like I'm good enough for God to use me. I don't feel like I have what it takes. Then you're in good company. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, and he says, For you see your calling, brethren. First of all, you need to get it out of your head. Paul's writing to the whole church, and he says, You see your calling, brethren, to the whole church. I think we just need to get it out of our heads and quit asking and trying to decide if we're called. Paul writes to the church and says, hey, you're all called. Every one of you is called. If you're saved, you're called. Now, you may not know what you're called for, but you need to quit praying and decide whether you're called or not. God called you. Just get it out of your mind. I'm saved for a reason. But he says there's not many wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. I'd like to be in that group, but I don't think I am. Again, nobody look at your neighbor for this next part. He says God chooses the foolish things of the world. He chooses the weak things of the world. He chooses the base or the low things of the world. He chooses the things which are despised. He chooses the things which are nothing. And he decides to use those people. So what is Paul saying? He's saying that if you feel like you're nothing and you're nobody and nobody cares who you are and society may have rejected you and you may be the low person out there, then you are exactly the kind of person that God God is looking to use. Paul says God calls the foolish. He calls the frail. He calls the faulted. He calls the forsaken. And his power rests upon them. And God uses them to do great and mighty things. God is looking for you. God needs you. He has called you to do something in his kingdom. Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I don't know why you think you're at this church, but the only reason that you're here, you can think it's any reason you want. You can think it's your choice. You can think circumstances, whatever. You can think it's your parents that brought you. But Scripture says the only reason that you are here is because God brought you here. He is fitly joining it together, making it so that there's no cracks, there's no openings. He is compacting it together. But it's not just Him. He does it and He compacts it together with what every joint supplies. That means God is building the church, but he needs you to do what he has called you to do. Because it is not compacted together. It is not fitly joined together unless you supply what God has brought you here to do. But I want you to notice something in this verse. That as we begin to do what we are supposed to do, there's all kinds of evangelism we can do. And I'm not opposed to any of that. But the last phrase says that when we start doing what God has asked us to do, There is no qualification on how big the job is, how spiritual the job is, how small it is. He just says, do what I've asked you to do. The last phrase says, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 
There is one surefire way for people to walk through the doors of this church that you don't know how they got here. You don't know who talked to them. And it is this. When I just start doing what God has asked me to do, the body will begin to increase. If I want to see revival, yes, I need to pray. Yes, I need to do those things. But I might just need to start doing what God has asked me to do. I might need to clean when they ask me to clean. I might need to be an usher or a greeter or a Sunday school teacher. But I've just, if I just start doing what God has asked me to do, then all of a sudden, revival will hit like never before. Let me tell you, God places you in the body, and the body needs what you have. This community needs what you have. God has loosed you for a purpose in his kingdom. We have time as a constant boundary in our lives. Our lives are governed by time, especially when we look in our Western context. Our lives are centered around time. Everything has a time. Other cultures, especially more ancient cultures, they had less of an emphasis on time as central. When we begin to think about something and when something happens, we usually have a time that it starts. What time is church? 10 o'clock. Well, I showed up at 11 and you guys were going, yeah, that's because church starts at 10. Focuses around time. Now, there's cultures today that are less focused around time and ancient cultures, but you can't experience those. But I've been in, in some cultures where, you know what time church starts? When we all get there. I know the sign says 10, but it might be 12. Why? Because it's when we all got there. It has less to do with the time and more about when they all showed up, which is frustrating if you're focused on time. I remember one time we got, one time, we were done with church. Done. Like, not saying an altar call, anything like that. We were done, fellowshipped, leaving. And somebody pulled up and said, is church over? Yes, it started almost three hours ago. <laughs> But God also operates and dwells outside of our time. There's instances in Scripture where specifics of time are mentioned, but I believe this is more for our understanding. It's not about God. It's not about His time frame. But, and Peter, he mentions in, in, in his epistle that he states that a day is as a thousand years to God, and sometimes we take that as, as poetic, but I think it has more truth than we realize. It's emphasizing the fact that God does not operate the same way that we do when it comes to time. Because of this, both of how God and how ancient cultures, other cultures operated, specifically cultures in Bible times, there's sometimes when we read scripture that we need to read things a little bit differently with a little bit different understanding than what we're used to. We read Galatians chapter 4 in verse 4. It brings us back around to the season which we have just celebrated. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. When I think of fullness of time, I think it was time for Jesus to be born. And in my head, I know it doesn't quite play out, but what goes on in my head is I begin to think, well, it's time. Like, it's time for Jesus to be born. God's like, what? oh, man, I better get Jesus born. What time is it? I don't want to be late. We begin to think that there's days and months. And I, I know sometimes it gets convoluted in our heads, but when we think of fullness of time, we think it was the time. For Jesus to be born. <laughs> but I don't think that's quite correct. I don't think whatever date it was, that it was Jesus had to be born because it was that date. Now God does have some specifics because he's a God of order, but we can find many, many instances in scripture, this is just one, where his focus is on something different than the specifics of time. As we think about it. Let me show you where I think the fullness of time 
actually refers to. It wasn't a day. It wasn't a specific hour. It wasn't a month. Perhaps you could even say it wasn't even the year. But I think we find the answer to the fullness of time in Luke chapter 1 in verse 38. In this chapter, the angel has appeared to Mary. And Mary has heard the angel say, you are blessed and highly favored. And she says, who me? She's confused and troubled by what the angel says. I don't know if you've ever been confused and troubled when God spoke to you. I don't know if you've ever asked that question back to God. Who, me? Who, me? And then the angel begins to give her some information. Yes, you, you are highly favored. You are the one that God is speaking to. You are the one that God has chosen. And then the angel begins to speak about how she's going to be used. The Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you and give you a child. Now, I've had God say some things to me, but nothing that strange. We'll leave that alone. But the how was more confusing than the me. I don't know if you ever had that happen. When it's not, you get past the it's me, and now God begins to say what he wants to do, and you're like, there's no way. There is no way on earth. Mary, I don't know if in this moment, she had even come to grips with, with it's me that you want to use. I, don't, I, I know that she had not figured out the how because there's no way you can figure out the how of the Holy Ghost overshadowing. I don't think she had every question answered. I don't think that she had everything all set in her mind. I don't think she had the path laid out before her so she could walk in confidence because she saw it all. But in Luke chapter 1 and verse 38, it says, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You see, I think when Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, the fullness of time, I don't think God was waiting for a specific date. I don't think he was waiting for that exact time on the calendar. God wasn't just trying to push through his plan because it's time for Jesus to be born, so he's got to be born. I think what the fullness of time means was God was waiting. He was waiting for Mary to utter these words, be it unto me according to thy word. You see, the time was not about a specific date. The fullness of time was about a person who decided, I'm going to do what God has asked me to do. And as soon as Mary said that, I believe God said, it's time now. There's someone who's willing to do what I've asked him to do. So what does that mean for me? Oh, I know we hear about revival. I know we hear things about what God wants to do. And we're at the end of the year. This is the last Sunday of 2021. Thought we were good. Now we got 2022, but let me just tell you, God, I know it's for us, and, and you, we'll probably hear things about what God wants to do next year, and this is our, that's fine, that's for us, but God is not concerned about 2022 because he doesn't have a 2022. God doesn't have it on his calendar that 2022 is the year of increase and the year of revival. And it doesn't matter what we do. God's going to bring revival. No, because God chose to partner with us. But I tell you what, it could be something if we would just begin to say, God, I want to do what you have asked me to do. God, I want to do what you have called me to do. God, be it unto me according to your word that all of a sudden God's not concerned about 2022, but he's concerned about Paul doing what he asked him to do and Luke doing what God asked him to do. And when they start doing it, then God says, now it's time. Now it's time. Now it's time. 
I tell you, we're just a few people away from saying, now is the time. Now is the time that we'll just say, you know what, God? I don't care what it is. I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. And all of a sudden, when I start doing what I'm supposed to do, revival starts to hit like never before. Why? Because when I do what I'm supposed to do, the body increases of its own accord. It's when people are ready. It's when people start saying, I'm ready. It's when people start saying, be it unto me according to your word. And I'm closing this morning very quickly. Run, Sister Sherry. Run to the keyboard. Run to that mercy seat. Zechariah the prophet wrote, almost 500 years before the story that we read about the donkey. And Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. So Jesus, to be who he said he was, had to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey because he had to fulfill every prophecy. He couldn't have rode in on a horse He couldn't have had his disciples, four of them, get together and do that chair thing where they hold arms and carry him in. He couldn't have found a large dog to ride in. He he had to ride in on a donkey. That was his only choice. That was it. That colt was nothing special. When Jesus rode in on that colt, that colt did nothing grand. I mean, a donkey does work and lets people ride on it. It just did what it was supposed to do. That's all it did. It didn't like tap dance in front of Jesus on the way in. It it wasn't like Balaam's donkey and sang a song right in front of Jesus. Now, that would have been miraculous. You know what the donkey did? Carried Jesus. Wow. Wow. Good job, donkey. He did what you were supposed to do. But because Jesus had to ride in on a donkey... All of history was waiting on that donkey. Because there could be no triumphal entry until the donkey showed up. If there was no triumphal entry, there would be no cross. There's no cross. There's no resurrection. There's no resurrection. There's no Acts chapter 2. If there's no Acts chapter 2, what are we doing here? All of history was waiting on this one donkey to just do what it was supposed to do. Nothing special, nothing grand, just what it was supposed to do. I don't know what prophecies, things that God may have spoken to you in your life. Let's just talk as a church. Things that God has prophesied into this church about what's going to happen. And who knows? Who knows if every one of those prophecies is just waiting on one person to say, yeah, I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. Again, it was nothing grand. It was nothing profound, that that, anything that that donkey did. Jesus said, sent his disciples and said, Bring that donkey here. He came. Jesus got on him. Rode him into town. And that was it. But every prophecy was riding. Not just Jesus. Every prophecy was riding on that donkey. Well, I'm just this. I'm just that. I don't have anything grand to offer. I, I, I think God's speaking to me, but it's not anything big. And I don't know if God even speaks in those little things. Yes, God even speaks to the donkeys. And let me just tell you, you don't know what is waiting on you. You don't know what prophecy in this church is waiting on you to just simply do what God has asked you to do. As we stand this morning,
God has given you authority. God has given you power. He's placed it inside of you for a reason and for a purpose. And that's to accomplish His will in your family, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your work, in this community. Or the community that you're from. God gave it to you for a reason. And I think God... In the day and age in which we live, I think God is saying it's time. I think God's ready. In fact, I think God's turned our world upside down, getting us all ready. But if you're waiting for that day of revival, I think you need to realize that you have more control of that day than you realize. Because it's more about you than it is about what time it is. God's waiting on you. God's waiting on me. I want us to pray right now. Lord Jesus, we come before you. Lord, we're so thankful, God. We're thankful, Lord, for that day that you set us free. And Lord, I pray right now that there are people in this place that need set free. Lord, you are still here to do it today. But Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes right now, that you would open our ears, that you would help us to understand. Lord, that no, I can't bring revival on my own. Lord, I can't fulfill prophecies on my own. Lord, I can't do any of those things. But God, you have partnered with me. You have partnered with me. And so Lord, I play a part. And Lord, the part I play this morning is not trying to figure out how it's going to happen. I'm not going to argue about whether it should be me or not. But Lord, I simply say, be it according to me, according to thy will, Lord. Lord, I simply say yes again. Lord, I simply offer myself again. Lord, in whatever way, whether it's large or small, God, you called me for a reason. Lord, you saved me for a reason. Oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to open this altar this morning. And if you want to come and offer that prayer again of simply saying, Lord, I want you to use me. Let me just say you're not here by accident in this church. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are. If you are here, then it's because there is a reason. And God is simply waiting on someone to say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it is. I may just be the colt. I may just do something small. It may just be insignificant. But, Lord, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do what you have asked me to do. Come on, this altar is open this morning. It's simply at the end of this year. I know it's it's about us. It's the end of the year and starting a new year. But simply as we close out one year and go to the next, we say, Lord, I'm seeing him before you right now. Lord, revival's not going to wait on me. I'm going to be ready. Your promises coming to pass are not going to wait on me. Lord, I offer myself to you right now. I open myself to you again, God. I know I may have said it before. But I say it again today. I simply say yes to your will. Yes to your purpose. Come on. Mary offered all the excuses, but finally she just had to say, Lord, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. Come on. Why don't you just put the excuses away? Because you don't have to figure it out. God doesn't ask us to do that. He just asks us to say yes. Lord, I'm partnering with you today. the promises they rest on me they rest on me doing my part Lord help me to understand what you placed inside of me God
come on, that's it. Some young people who will say, Lord, I want you to use me, God. I want you to do whatever you want with my life, God. I may not understand it all. I may not have it all figured out. But Lord, I simply say yes to you today. Come on, you may be like Mary. She was just a teenage girl. And she had no clue how God was going to do anything. But she just said yes. Yes, Lord. Oh, that's it. Come on. If you've got the Holy Ghost, God has put his power. He has put his authority. Come on. There's resurrection power inside of you. Come on. You need to realize what is in you. There is power to change. There is power to affect your family and your work and your school and your community. There is power inside of you. I give myself away so And I want us to do something this morning. I know it's the Sunday after Christmas. I understand that. We've been eggnogged out and everything. But if you want the Lord to use you, I just want you to step forward a little bit. Come forward. Come forward. Now we're going to do this a little bit different because usually we reverse this. We pray about God using us. And then we kind of leave. But I think God wants to use us today. If you have the Holy Ghost, you've got something inside of you. And the Holy Ghost works through us, so that means it works through our personality, works through who we are. So that means you don't have to be as loud as someone else. You don't have to be as quiet as someone else. It's the Holy Ghost working through you. It's a partnership, okay? So this is not about doing it like you've seen anyone else do it. But if you have the Holy Ghost, you have resurrection, life-giving power inside of you. How many of you believe that? I mean, you really believe it. So there's people today that are still just like that donkey. They're bound. Whether it's an addiction, depression, there's people that need the Holy Ghost here today. There's people that need life today. And we have people all across this place that just raised their hand and said, yes, I believe I have life-giving power inside of me. So why does anyone need to leave without being loose today? When all of us are here, You have the power to speak life. So I asked all those who believe that to step forward, that you want God to use you to step forward. And this is why I said we usually do this a little bit different. So this will be confusing for just a moment. <laughs> That's how it is when I'm up here. It's confusing. But if you have a need in your life today, if you feel like that cult, it doesn't matter if it's depression, sickness, if you need the Holy Ghost, if you need to repent for the first time, if you have something that you need life spoken into you today, I want you to step back. Step, step back, step back. Those of you who can step forward. I know I said it'd be confusing. Step forward, step back if you want prayer. Not forward. We're not coming forward for prayer. We're going back for prayer. If you want prayer today, step back. If you need the Holy Ghost today and you want the Holy Ghost, step back. I believe God can do it in this place today, okay? 
I know we're all kind of up here, so maybe if you didn't see who stepped back, I just want you to raise your hand if you want prayer. Just raise your hand if you want prayer today. If you want the Holy Ghost, if you need healing, if you need deliverance, just lift your hand today. Lift it high so we can see. Okay? It doesn't matter if you're not up front. If you're in, if you're in the crowd, that's fine. Lift your hand. Okay? Now around these people with their hands raised, keep your hands up. There is life all around. It's everywhere. That's why I asked, do you believe that you have power and authority inside of you? And you don't have to do this like anyone else. Okay? But I'm going to ask people that raised their hand and said, I want to be used by God. Okay? I'm not asking you to preach a sermon, anything like that. When, when Jesus said, I'm leaving power and authority, and I'm giving it to you, it wasn't to a select few, it was to everyone. So Tabitha, who sewed clothes, was her ministry, she had power and authority inside of her. That's why when she died, they refused to bury her. Because she made such a difference. So this is not about how loud you can pray, or how much force, if that's how you want to pray, that's fine with me. This is not about what your role is. This is about the Holy Ghost inside of you. All those verses I read, that you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That you can pray for someone who doesn't have the Holy Ghost and they can receive it. That you can bind on earth and it can be bound in heaven. That's all of you that raise your hands. That's all of us. So again, if you want prayer this morning, I want you to raise your hand. And then I want people, if you've got the Holy Ghost, I want you to find someone here. I want you to ask them what they need prayer for. If they need the Holy Ghost, I want you to pray that way. And I want you to pray for them. Okay? Sorry, I, I'm sorry I'm taking just a moment. I don't want you to just stand back here. I want you to pray for them. I want you to go to them. I want you to pray for them. Okay? Lay hands on the sick. They shall, I want you to pray for them. Don't be afraid. You've got the power of the Holy Ghost inside of you. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. And I believe that God is going to work through individuals in this church that said, yes, I want to be used. Why are we going to wait? Let God use you right now. Let Him use you right now. I want us to pray one more time before we do that. And I want us to pray that God would give us the confidence of the Holy Ghost. To simply pray a prayer of faith over someone. I want us to pray right now. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would increase our faith right now. Lord, it's not ourselves. We're not bringing ourselves in who we are. But Lord, it's simply acknowledging the power that you have put inside of us. That you have given us power and authority to loose, to speak life, to lay hands on someone. And your power work through us. And Lord, I'm praying right now, Lord, that you would work through people in this place. They may never have laid hands on anyone before and something happened, but they've said yes. And today, something's going to happen in the name of Jesus. Now, if you need prayer in this place, lift your hand. I know I've asked you a bunch. Lift your hand. And I want people to go to them. Ask them, do they need prayer for healing? Do they need the Holy Ghost? Are they dealing with something emotionally? You don't have to go into detail. Just give them the basics of what you need prayer for. And then I want you to go to them. I want you to lay hands on them. And by the authority of the Spirit of God, I want you to speak life. Come on. Speak life into them. There's resurrection power in this place. Let this be the day that you quit praying, God use me, and let God use you. Come on, that's it. Come on. Someone's going to be loose today. Someone's going to be set free today. Someone's going to receive the Holy Ghost today. Come on, the last Sunday of this year, God's going to transform your life today. Come on, that's it. Come on, if the person you're praying for needs some instruction, give it to them. If you need the Holy Ghost, don't quit praying. Let it keep coming out. You got to keep talking and let the Holy Ghost come out of you like a river. 
come on right now we speak life into people struggling with depression and fear and anxiety we speak joy right now we speak hope right now come on people with addictions we speak deliverance right now that God will set you free right now people that need healing right now that his healing power would begin to flow from the top of your head to the soles of your feet that you would find relief and restoration right now oh come on that's it come on some of you pray and need to let the spirit of god flow through you you need to speak words to that person that the spirit is telling you to speak Come on, it's not you, it's the Spirit of God. Those are words of life. Oh, come on, that's it. Come on. Come on, it's time. It's time. It's time for people to be healed. It's time for people to be set free. It's time for people to be delivered. It's time for people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we're doing it. We're stepping up and we're saying it. Oh, come on. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We feel your power moving right now. We feel your spirit moving right now. Hallelujah, Lord God.
Amen. If you're still praying in the altars, I encourage you to keep doing that. I feel like there's a sweet presence of God in this place right now, a healing power that is in this place right now. Anything that you need from God, He can help you out with that situation today because of His love, because of how much He cares about you, and because of the power that is here today. Amen. I'm going to go uh, through a couple prayer requests here real quick as they are praying. We need to remember Mike Wood today because he is sick. Donna Matt Miller uh, is suffering from a back injury. Uh, Sister Norma Tate is on hospice. And Don Coker has a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Uh, so if we keep all of these needs in mind, uh, staying in this vein of uh, the power of God that is here right now, if there is a need that you have, I encourage you to step forward. The ministry staff is making their way up at this time to pray for you, to pray the prayer of faith, believing that God is going to heal and is going to touch you today. So if you have a need, I encourage you to step forward and they will meet you here today. Let's go ahead and pray one more time. God, I thank you for the power that has fallen down upon us in this place today, God. Lord, I thank you, God, for your healing touch that is in this place today, God. Lord, I pray, God, that you will have your way in each and every need that is in this place today, God. Lord, I pray, God, that your, your power will fall down upon us, God. Lord, it doesn't matter what we came into this place with today, God. I believe in for us to being able to be leaders Leave, leave this place being transformed, God. Lord, I pray, God, that you will touch Mike Wood today as he is sick, God. Lord, I pray, God, that you touch Sister Donna Matt Miller today, God, with her back injury, God. Lord, I pray, God, that your angels will encamp around about Norma Tate today. Lord, I pray, God, that as Don Coker goes to the to the hospital, to, goes to the doctor tomorrow, God, I pray, Lord, that you will have your way, God. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, God, that you will touch Sister Lois Hayes, God. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, God, that your angels will encamp around about her, God. Lord, I believe in for your victory. Lord, I believe in for your healing to transpire and transform in this place today, God. Lord, and I pray, God, that every person that came forward today needing something from you, God, Lord, I pray, God, that you will touch them, God. Lord, I pray that you will move in their situation, God. Lord, I plead the blood on their situation right now in Jesus' name, God. Lord, I believe in for your Holy Ghost power and fire to fall in our needs today, Jesus. Lord, I worship you, God. Lord, I give you all the glory and all of the honor today, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kyle, for an awesome message today. Makes me kind of miss you. <laughs> kind of. I said kind of. No. Uh, but really, uh, thank you, Brother Kyle, for preaching to us. I know that if it wasn't for anyone else, it was definitely for me today. So I thank you. I uh, appreciate everything that you're, uh, you're doing, that your family's doing. We hate to lose Isaac, but anyway. So um, we're, I'm going to go over a couple announcements really quick. Um, need you to kind of listen um, because they might be kind of confusing. We are having a New Year's Eve pizza party Friday, December 31st at 6.30 here in the gym. The pizza, salad, drinks, and dessert will be provided. We will have a program, but it will not last until midnight. So due to the New Year's Eve party, there will be no service or activities at the church on Wednesday, December 29th. So that means this coming Wednesday, we will not have church. We are starting a month of prayer. Uh, beginning January. Uh, so we're beginning 2022 uh, on a focused prayer. And so January 2nd through the 30th, we will have more details that will be coming up uh, or coming to us next Sunday. But we will have prayer and fasting revival January 3rd through the 7th. And so because of that, there will be no prayer meeting tomorrow night. But starting in January, Monday night prayer will be at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary from here on out. So it was originally 7 p.m., but we're moving it to 6. So from here on out, it will be 6. If you get here at 7, it'll be kind of like what Brother Kyle was preaching. Well, church is already over. Prayer meeting might be over. It just depends. Uh, but So please keep that in mind that it will be at 6 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock. We will not have prayer meeting this coming Monday, and we will not have a um, 
you, youth service, good Lord. You can tell that I always, always deal with the youth. Uh, we will not have any church here on Wednesday night. So uh, if the ushers would make their way forward, and they're already here. Man, look at that. All right, so if, um, as the ushers make their way up here, if you would make your way back to your seat. Please do not forget the announcements. Uh, if you have any questions, Sister Teresa said she will take all the texts and phone calls. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so let's go ahead and pray over this offering today. And then as you give the offering, you can march to give the offering and then march your way uh, to out of service <laughs> to be with family. Uh, anyway, so let's go ahead and pray. God, I thank you again for the touch and the move that was in this place today. God, I thank you for each and every individual that was in this place today, God. And I pray that you will bless this offering, God. I pray that you will touch those that have and those that have not today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, you can go ahead and march for the offering. and. Then